I used to go in and hold myself accountable to these numbers because I knew it was what I needed to do to achieve the results I wanted. Um, and I split my day into two. I'd do at least 50 calls in the morning up until lunch. If I haven't done it by lunchtime, I'll have lunch later. Welcome to Sales Pipe Pros Podcast. Here's your host, Mike Petrosian. All right, everyone, welcome to Sales Pipe Pros. Today, my guest is all the way across the pond in London, UK. He has an extensive background in sales, but now had the grit to start his own company. And I'm super excited to have him. Craig Maxwell, welcome, my friend. Thank you, Mike. Pleasure to be here. And thanks for reaching out. It's, uh, it's awesome that you've started your own podcast as well. <laughs> I've kind of been toying with the idea of doing something, uh, or getting more video out there, or just being more public, but haven't quite crossed that chasm yet. So <laughs> you, should start, to you. you should consider it, man. It was actually the startup cost and the process is actually pretty simple. I could walk you through it, but I do it because it's a lot of fun. But I appreciate you taking the time as well. Um, before we get into your business, love to talk about your, how you started in sales, your previous roles. I saw you had some, uh, individual contributing roles at certain companies. Let's talk about how it all started for you in sales. Yeah, actually it's an interesting story. Um, now I guess everybody tells you they accidentally one up themselves. So it's probably not interesting from that standpoint. Um, <laughs> but it um, it started off, I was, um, so I studied music. My background's really in, I guess, creative arts in that sense, right? I was playing guitar, I was in some rock bands, you know, kind of enjoying the life, let's say. I got to the point of coming up to, you know, the age where I could uh, decide if I wanted to have a degree in music. And I thought, well, actually, do I really want to study music all my life and just kind of um, yeah, go between gig to gig, maybe teaching and having ad hoc work? Or do I need an actual solid, base of my career that I can uh, earn money from essentially and live, right? I took the latter route and I thought, okay, well, I'll just get a job, the first job I can get, right? And just start there, right? I need to get an income. So I worked at McDonald's. Like I was like, okay, who will give me a job straight away? I'll go there. Uh, did that, like just hammered through it, just found that there was ways to kind of get through ranks pretty quick. And I was like, okay, well, I see how you kind of play this game. I kind of become a crew trainer, you become a manager, then you can assistant manager, a store manager. And I just got to the end and it was like, well, this is really kind of monotonous and boring now. I feel like I'm stuck. Like, how do I go beyond that? Like, it was a bit, um, I feel like I hit the glass ceiling of, of McDonald's. And I, <laughs> this is not like much, but at the time I was like, oh, there must be more than this. So I told my flatmates at the time like, about this frustration, like wanting to kind of improve their business in general. Like there's so many opportunities been to like, Band uh, operational efficiencies. I, I was kind of pointing out these areas then, but nobody really cared. It was like, well, well, it's a McDonald's, so we're just going to make the burgers, right? This is what we do. I was like, ah, okay, I get it. It's just a machine. Um, so I obviously wanted to break away from that. In telling my flatmates at the time these frustrations, I'm like, dude, you should just like do something else, like sales <laughs> or consulting or something, because I think you can probably put this skill set. So that direction at the time I had no, no freaking idea about technology sales or anything like that. I mean, I was fascinated by tech my whole life, but, um, like I'd break things apart and try to rebuild them. I was fascinated by like Lego, um, the engineering robotics kind of stuff when I was a right. kid, but I never really got into like sales for any particular reason, but this is the accidental part. So one of my flatmates at one point, um, he decided to, he'll remain unnamed. Uh, he decided to, um, uh, tell me about my job not being so um, good one day, uh, let's say, and we got into a bit of a discussion. It ended up with him smashing my iPhone at the time, which is a 3GS. <laughs> that was like years ago, so it was a great phone. Um, I was like, wow, dude, um, we'll talk tomorrow. Um, he might have been slightly inebriated. And um, <laughs> I, I gave him a knock on his door the next morning, like once he all calmed down and said, hey, dude, I know we kind of got into a disagreement. You kind of tell me I've got a a rubbish job um, and obviously that's not cool but you did break my phone and you should probably replace that um his response was that he could not actually afford to because he was living off his parents kind of paying his rent and actually he's looking for jobs right now but one thing that he did offer 
was the business card of the job that he didn't take. And that oh. was the CEO of the company that I then called and asked for a job at, um, which was the first tech company that I'd worked for, um, where I started as an SDR on a very, very low salary. And I'd say if you had to like consider that as what it would be based on the market, probably less than 50% of what a market rate would be easily, easily. Well, I'll tell you the figure actually, wow. 15,000 pounds was my wow. annual salary on five, not five zero. So that was a hell of a start. And that was cold calling uh, from a self-sales database with practically no process. Is that 15 pounds, 15,000 pounds with commission at least? No, no, no. There was commission on top. Yeah. But it was only on closed okay. business. Oh, so, gotcha. and that was at a, that was at a rate of, I think at the time, the software, I, I think the rate was 4%. Then I managed to wangle it up to 6%, but still as an SDR getting paid in closed business in a SaaS company on that level of salary, I was working from 9 AM till 9 PM in the office. 12 hours a day because I need to learn quick. I need to figure this out. Yeah. I need to make a way for, to make, make your money. <laughs> the 15,000 yeah, exactly right. pounds was going to survive um, on that. But in doing that, I, I learned so much. I actually would not have done it any other way. When you first started, did you mm -hmm. have a playbook? I mean, it was, this was your first sales job. What was your process to start actually closing deals and getting some money in the bank? Uh, it was, more, here's a CRM, please figure it out. We have customers installing our app. Can you please go ahead and call them? It's kind of like semi inbound, but you're going out to answer them. Right. Um, so just, we're, we're figuring everything out as we go. At first, I remember picking up the phone the first day, I was, I was scared to make a call. I was like, oh my God, this is like stage fright. And I remember actually, um, like a couple of the team were like, they had to sit with me for about half an hour, like just giving me the courage to pick up the phone. <laughs> um, once I got, once I got over that initial fear, it was, just, um, I was just going ferociously trying to figure things out and it was, there was no playbook or process to follow, um, which is why it took so long. Right. And it's why I'm so passionate about doing that for other businesses now, yeah. um, in the capacity that I work out either as a manager or a consultant. How many calls do you remember how many calls it took to actually help you make your first sale? I can remember that. And it was at least. 50 to 75 calls per day uh, out of that I'd get an average conversion of about three to four discovery calls booked. And out of that, I'd get about 50% rate to actual demo. Um, and then obviously you can work out from the back of that typical close rates are about 60% ish. So wow. to get a deal, um, in the pipeline, it'd be 75 calls really. And going through that process with them as a kind of funnel. Uh, once I figured that out, it was just systematic. And I built my own sales reports and dashboards to report on myself. I used to go in and hold myself accountable to these numbers because I knew it was what I needed to do to achieve the results I wanted. Um, and I split my day into two. I'd do at least 50 calls in the morning up until lunch. If I haven't done it by lunchtime, I'll have lunch later. Then next half of the day, I'd repeat. And it worked like a charm. Uh, I couldn't believe how... Um, easy it felt after you figured that out because all of a sudden um you know your leading indicators and lagging indicators and once you figure that out right um it's never a concern that you're not going to hit your number did you start to enjoying point. it at that point once you figured out yeah. the playbook it was fun for you right totally totally it was like a complete game changer it took a while it did take a long time to figure out um and it took a lot of grit, right? Especially if you're getting paid a low, low base. I mean, it got increased gradually throughout that process, throughout the years, of course. Don't worry about that too much. Uh, it's not so bad now. But um, it was, yeah, that, that was a complete game changer. And the options after that were to either hire a team under it and train them up on it or go mm -hmm. somewhere else. And eventually I, I, I chose to, to move to um, pastors new, but then take away those learnings and implement them in more of a kind of sales operations slash uh, business development manager role to take on a new gotcha. team. So uh, during your whole sales career process, did you have a specific methodology that you've started following at some point in time? Uh, any sort of specific training, like a medic or a challenger sale, anything along those lines? 
Actually, no, not in the latter end of the funnel. Um, I'm because my background is so heavily focused on top of the funnel stuff. I looked at obviously everything like Dan Champ, uh, all of the, the initial qualification funnel, and those methodologies. But to be honest with you, towards the end of the funnel, um, in closing, I just followed the best sales rep in that business that I was working at initially and copied what he was doing, took his advice and his coaching on board. And he taught me so much, actually. Um, I, I would, yeah, pin a lot of my success in actually closing on to solving him. And that was all about value selling, really. If I can summarize it now, I couldn't at the time tell you what it was. It was value selling or gap selling, if you follow Keenan. So <laughs> it, it's all, that was really where I was leaning towards. Uh, understanding, qualifying. Again, it kind of leads into what I mentioned before about heavily leaning on the, um, the importance of qualification and the top of the funnel work and how much right. impact that can have in getting you through to the end of the cell. Um, no matter what methodology you're following throughout uh, final pipeline stages through to close, if you don't understand early on what the pain is and how to quantify it, to really quantify it in their mind and then adjust it to the actual reality of the opportunity cost of inaction, of the status quo. If you can't highlight that, then no one's ever gonna make a decision because buying software is a gamble. It's not a choice. You are taking a gamble. Yeah. And not doing anything is always easier and cheaper in their mind. I'm actually glad you brought that up. How do you deal with a customer or prospect, I guess I should say, that is asking for a cheaper cost based on what they've seen in the market or based on a competitor they've seen? How do you uh, respond to someone like that? I would have a back down on the value that I'd identified or helped them identify within the business again. Um, if, and if that wasn't there and available, then I would have already told them about those competitors up front. Because the first thing I do when I open up a call is set the scene. Like, hey, here's how this is going to go down. I'm going to first ask you a few questions about your current state. And I have to say it frankly, I don't have to say current state, right? But however I frame it, that's what I'm doing. But the reason why I'm going to do that is because actually there's a few reasons. I obviously don't want to waste your time. I'm not going to waste any of my time. And I'm not going to try and show you something that isn't really going to help you or add any value to your business. Right. If I find that out early on, I will actually point you to our nearest competitor. If I feel I can help you better, they might be cheaper, they might be um, just better suited to your needs. And at the end of the day, it'll save us both time and it'll actually help you. Does that sound fair to you? That's the next step. Like if, if somebody says no to you offering your, like your actual competitors to them at the beginning of a call, I'd be super, super surprised by that. But it usually gets people talking on a very open level about actually what is going on. Because you know what? At that point, you're a consultant. And if you really understand the challenges that that business has, and you've done them yourself, you've been in that pain, um, you can generally, you know, genuinely help people, actually. Right. Um, as long as you get that across early on, um, I think you would typically be the vendor of choice. And if you weren't, it'd be because you turned them away. So the objection of price in that frame typically doesn't occur. It would happen earlier on if the value wasn't there, but you'd be almost going for the no, essentially. You have a business now of your own. Tell us a little mm. bit about how you started it, why you started it, and a little bit about the value prop. Love to hear all about it. Yeah, so um, I started Sales Hard. It was actually called Sales Path initially, uh, but I wanted the .com domain, so I kind of switched it up. Um, I started that back in uh, January 2019, and. Um, the real reasons why I wanted to do this is because, I mean, there are so many sales enablement products in the market and I was using some, I was actually selling some and I just like, there were so many things that I wanted to kind of change about it to make it better suited to my needs to the point actually where I started to teach myself to code to a very basic level, just looking at different JavaScript, looking at like, hello world, Chrome extensions and kind of seeing what you can do to make cool stuff happen. Um, 
like to the point where I would recommend features to our current product team that I work for. Uh, sometimes they would get implemented. Uh, there'd be custom requirements for a customer, which maybe it would like suit not just the customer, but actually a complete segment that we could open up in a market. And sometimes that would happen. Sometimes they obviously get blown under the water. But when they did happen, I realized that actually, okay, talking back on the margins and all those things that you were mentioning before, I've now improved the product, which increases the market share. But actually, all I do is increase the potential conversion rate of the commission that I can earn from selling said product. So actually, why don't I instead learn to build a product? And that sort of really got me started. Because if I can move the needle 10% in somebody else's business, that's 100% if it's mine. And it's also um, something I found a huge uh, intellectual challenge and I just enjoyed it a lot. So it, it kind of started as a bit of a hobby and I guess it kind of still is because I do enjoy it. So tell me about the actual value prop. Who's your ideal customer? What are some of your sales strategies to actually obtain those customers? And um, a little bit about the actual process to get them onboarded. Yeah, sure. So uh, sales had is a LinkedIn integration for Salesforce. And um, it's a Chrome extension, so it's really simple. Uh, you mm -hmm. download a Chrome extension, connect it to Salesforce in about 20 seconds, and then it's instantly showing you what's already in your CRM as you're viewing Mike Petrosian's LinkedIn profile. Oh, here gotcha. we go. Here's a leading contact for the, for the account. I can edit, update, um, add a new record if you didn't exist. And it obviously saves um, mainly SDRs, but also account execs. I tell the time if they're also doing 360 or prospecting, doing research, not crossing over other people's uh, contacts accidentally, being able to see things like the last activity history or the last activity right there in LinkedIn from Salesforce is a huge uh, win. Prevents a lot of uh, right. crossfire, you know? Um, so it's just about giving visibility. In terms of um, yeah, onboarding, it, yeah, it's just a Chrome extension. In terms of customer acquisition, um, I do nothing in terms of outbound for sales hub right now. Really? Um, so SEO, um, a few different landing pages, targeting different keywords, um, a few different uh, review websites, Captera, G2 Crowd, et cetera. Um, uh, really just a lot of that um, I focused on to really make this, um, I guess, a hands-off, zero-touch shell to start with. Uh, which is ironic, right? Given my background in kind of prospecting and stuff. Again, I guess, I mean, in my early days when I started off as an SDI, I was calling these inbound leads anyway. A lot of them had just gone cold. So you knew they were a fit because they were a fit once. So chances are the company wouldn't have changed, but actually maybe that particular user did. But you don't target the users. You target the directors, the managers, the CEOs, the, you know, the people who are actually really concerned about the issues that these team members are trying to solve themselves on the ground. And that comes back down to identifying the value, right? So if I was right. to go out and sell or try to actively sell, um, it would be through uh, the active user base just as an identifier. It's a, a lead generation source effectively. Do you have certain tools of your own that help you manage your business outside of the Chrome extension that you actually manage, but like uh, obviously you use Salesforce as one of the, the tools that's kind of driving it all LinkedIn, probably sales nav, I'm guessing. Yeah, so besides that, um, yeah, obviously Salesforce, LinkedIn, Sales Navigator, I use um, HubSpot for marketing, SEO tools for sure, because they help with everything I'm doing right now, which is effectively generating a massive top of the funnel pipeline. Right. Um, and getting the product out there, getting product feedback is the current kind of, do you, uh, I'm seeing a lot of, uh, in the market right now, I'm a head of sales and operations for a SaaS here in San Francisco. I'm seeing a lot of, um, these LinkedIn bots that are, uh, emailing or messaging people directly asking for a connect. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, once they get a connect, maybe they're asking for more information. I'll give you an example. I was reached out by a recruiter. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like very human. <laughs> I thought it was mm -hmm. 
Hey, Mike, how's it going? Love to connect with you. I see you're in San Francisco. Like it was talking to me. Mm -hmm. And I, I usually take recruiter calls. I'm, I'm one of those guys that I believe, you know, A, paying it forward, but B, expanding your network. You know, that's one more recruiter I talked to. That's another one I could potentially, they could introduce me to a company yeah, that right on. I may not join, but now I have that contact and maybe could sell to them later on. So going back to all that, what is your take on these bots that are coming out right now that are kind of disrupting the industry? And have you seen any success or have you even even used them at all? Um, I've, uh, yeah, I'll be honest with you. I've, I've had my team use them before. Um, I've had a team of SDRs turn them on. Um, and we've toyed with a couple ones, but the only thing it's good for is if you've got a very well-defined list of, of contacts in sales navigator and you must use navigator, otherwise you just would not, um, be, you'll be running rough shot over everything and look absolutely, um, silly. Um, and then it, it would just be to connect with someone. You shouldn't be sending automated messages, in my opinion. It's just not, it's not needed or necessary. If you want to connect and build your network, um, that's great. If people accept your connection, then okay, you start the conversation as you normally would. That's fine. I do not really agree with automating initial outreach. If you make a phone call with someone and you can't get through, leave a voicemail, set them on a cadence, right? Fine. Yeah, send the first email. Maybe you've got some automated follow-ups. But please, my God, put some other phone calls in there. Don't just set and forget things. Right. It, it will um, just ruin the reputation of sales reps everywhere if people keep um, setting and forgetting right. or trying to automate or get the, um, I guess, the silver bullet. It doesn't exist, and it will have the opposite effect. It will just be a trend, a peak in a trough. One thing that we had considered was reminders. Uh, and follow-ups LinkedIn it. messages because actually you know what if you're going to start the conversation anyway I, i'm not against connecting with people that that i'm really not it's when you get a big one page message followed by a pdf attachment and that link that unfurls oh, right. and blocks your screen you can't read it all i never read them because i know they're coming from these bots but if it's just a short message that says hey mike love to connect with you that's great that's like yeah. that recruit did it right not everybody does it right because yeah. you couldn't tell if that was a person or not. The follow-ups, I mean, yeah, like I said, right? I mean, as long as you've made the initial connection, personally, yeah, I don't mind so much if you're following up with them automated. It does actually, all, it does come down but, to the copy end of data. You're right. I mean, I, I see sales reps sending off. I, I get these emails all the time for sales tools and stuff like that. And they send me essay long <laughs> multiple paragraphs with value add and heavens know what else so i immediately just delete those but if yeah, i try to read email, that on your apple watch <laughs> right <laughs> yeah exactly uh so if i but if i get a quick message hey mike uh we have this quick uh, tool love to see if you're a fit can we get on a call it shouldn't take longer than five to ten minutes i'd actually consider that um, I quickly look at the domain and see if it would bring value to my business, of course, but I appreciate that message a lot more than, Hey, Mike, we're this, we were funded by this, th these are our metrics. These are our case studies. We think you're going to be the right person. And yeah, clearly mm -hmm. I'm not the right one. Cause that's probably like one of those email blitzes or outreach campaign or yes, we're campaign or something. So, you know, it's a great guy for copy, uh, Jeff Molander. Jeff you don't Molander. follow him already on. Yeah, if you don't follow him already on LinkedIn, give him a follow. His content is on point. Business-wise, it uh, seems like things are going well. What is the next step for you? What does your three, five-year plan look like? Uh, yeah, so uh, the plan, uh, first step is really to um, cross the chasm of profitability. Um, so once you're there, obviously you have a development function which can just build you whatever your brain can imagine. So that's the ultimate goal. In the meantime, I'm kind of, I'm doing some consulting work. I'm working with different startups. Um, so that's obviously helping to fund this and get me there. Uh, also, the great thing is that some of these businesses use Salesforce anyway. I'm implementing Salesforce at some points in time. Um, so it can kind of have a neutral crossover into them, eventually right. even using the product sometimes. Um, in terms of the goals from beyond that, I'm looking to find a technical co-founder right now who can help just accelerate the product side of things. 
I'm obviously more sales focused, so sales and marketing focus um, than products. I like the product side of it, but I can't split my brain two ways efficiently. Like you can be creative and logical, but you either lean one way or the other, right? right. It's just, I'm more, uh, definitely leaning more towards the sales and operational kind of side of the business. So look to find somebody to take that over. And then, um, yeah, I don't really have an end game. Everyone says you should look to either get acquired or, or make a certain X million figure, but you know what? I'm just enjoying the ride and I want to see where it takes me. Yeah. So with that said, let's go to the last question. What advice would you give to someone that started off as an individual contributor, then ended up starting their own business? What advice would you give to someone that wants to branch off into entrepreneurship and take that risk? Do it yesterday. <laughs> Amen. Because you'll think about it for years. You will, naturally. And you'll consider the risks. And yeah, they're real. That's fine. But they're never going to go away or become less risky. The risk of doing nothing, again, funnily enough, just like in a sales process, applies in this very instance. Absolutely. Just do it. You have nothing to lose. Like you say, starting a podcast. What well, really was the up upshot of that? It's not that much overhead. Um, but you're doing it, right? Um, it's the same with any idea that anybody has. If they're an individual contributor, if they think they can add value, if they think it's, it's right, if they've got a hunch and they want to test it, just throw up a landing page, throw up a website. You don't need a product yet as well. That's the other thing, right? In the, um, it's all well and good to say and just do it yesterday. But actually, how do you do it yesterday? Well, you do the minimum viable thing. And it's not, it doesn't have to be a minimum viable product. It just be a copy on a landing page, get some hits, get some signups, get people to the, request something on, on a waiting list, put something yeah. on product hunt, just do anything, but do it. Don't wait, just get it done. Yeah, totally. Well, Craig, really appreciate your time, man. You're definitely an inspiration to all the salespeople. I, I, you nailed it when you said, while you're in, if you're enjoying what you're doing, it shouldn't be work. This should just be another hobby. So I definitely, definitely. respect that. Uh, thanks for joining me. Totally. And uh, excellent. Likewise, pleasure. Thank you, Mike. Thank Speak you, soon. Buddy. Thanks for joining. For more episodes, visit salespipepros.com.